Welcome everyone. Uh, I'm, I'm very glad to uh, present this week's seminar with Simon Gilchrist. Uh, Simon is a professor of economics at Boston University and a research associate at the MBR. Uh, his research interests relate to monetary economics and applied macro and uh, most of his research has focused on consequences of financial markets turmoil and its impact on a uh, real economic activity with a particular focus on the implications for investment behavior, business cycle dyna dynamics and the conduct of monetary policy. Uh, Simon received his BA from Iowa State University and then his PhD from the University of Wisconsin and he has been at BU since 1995 but before that he served at as a staff economist at the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve System and he has held visiting positions at MIT and the Federal Reserve Bank of uh, New York. Uh, he has served as an academic consultant to several institutions including the Board, the Bank of Canada, the Bank of England, uh, the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston, the one of New York, San Francisco and the IMF. So without further ado, let me uh, introduce Simon Gilchrist who will be talking today about inflation dynamics during the financial crisis, joint work with uh, Jay Sim, Egon Sakurajek and uh, I don't know the name of, oh, I have it here. Uh, okay, well, uh, Raphael Ishmael. So thank you very much Simon. Go Great. ahead. Um, okay, so just um, make sure you can hear me. Um, so, right, this is joint work with Raphael Schoenli and Jason and Egon Zakrajczak. And there's a disclosure that these views don't represent the views of the Board of Governors. So, um, so what I want to talk about today is thinking about the linkage between um, financial markets and financial frictions and the possible effect on uh, inflation dynamics. So one of the big questions for uh, the aftermath of the financial crisis is that in spite of a massive contraction in economic activity uh, during the financial crisis, the general level of prices has remained surprisingly stable. So people, some people have dubbed this the missing inflation, uh, deflation. So that raises the question, what factors might account for the absence of deflationary pressures in light of what looks like enormous and persistent slack in the economy? So what we're going to do in this uh, paper is that we investigate the effect of financial conditions on firms price setting during the Great Recession period. Okay, so... Um, before I get to the main topic of the paper, uh, it's useful to just think about different types of financial mechanisms and how they affect the economy. So the typical financial mechanism that uh, macroeconomists have focused on are associated with what I would call the financial accelerator mechanism. So in that type of a framework, the uh, borrowing capacity of firms and households depends on borrower net worth. And negative shocks to the economy cause contractions in asset prices. And as asset prices contract, net worth contracts, and financial positions deteriorate. And as a consequence, households and firms spend less. And then there's a strong feedback loop in the economy. Um, further deterioration in activity causes further declines in asset prices, et cetera. So this type of mechanism, uh, which is at the heart of, say, Bernanke and Gertler or the Cristiano Maltero Mostano paper, Bernanke, Gertler, Gilchrist, uh, this type of mechanism in a model where there are nominal um, frictions would typically produce a positive co-movement between inflation and output. Okay. So um, now we can also think of other mechanisms that would be uh, more supply side rather than demand side driven mechanisms. And uh, recent work, uh, early work by Nobu Kiyotaki and then recent work by people like Burr and Mull and Batsato et al. have emphasized the idea that 
financial frictions might distort the allocation of inputs to production. So um, basically the idea is that uh, inputs aren't allocated efficiently across producers in the economy because uh, producers with good opportunities but low net worth can't take full advantage of the good opportunities. And that this type of uh, allocation friction becomes worse in a downturn. So this type of mechanism would create uh, endogenous movements in aggregate TFP over the business cycle potentially. And that could generate negative co-movement between inflation and output. It would look more like a supply side mechanism than a demand side mechanism. Now, although I find reallocation stories appealing, I don't actually think that they're that persuasive over the business cycle because it's just difficult to reallocate input substantially across production units at the business cycle frequency. So I think of this as more of a low frequency story than a high frequency story. So I'm, I'm less convinced by, by that type of a mechanism, but that's something one could think about. Um, so then the, the, the third mechanism that I want to think about, which is the one I'm going to talk about today, is what I'm going to call a pricing mechanism. And here the idea is that firms operate in markets, in what I'll call customer markets, where if they set a low price today, um, they'll achieve less revenue today, but they'll attract more customers to their product, and that will create more demand for the future. So in this type of an environment, uh, a price is like an investment. And so um, when there are severe financial frictions, firms are less likely to want to engage in investment activity. So when financial frictions become more severe, they're less interested in setting a low price to build up future demand. So essentially the idea is that they're willing to sacrifice future demand in order to maintain high cash flows today uh, because the value of a dollar to the firm today is much higher than the value in the future. So this is a mechanism I'm going to explore. It's a mechanism that's been highlighted in the past by Gottfried and then Chevalier and Sharfstein most notably. It's also related to what I would call the cost channel of monetary policy, which Barth and Rainey have discussed. The idea being in the cost channel that um, borrowing costs are part of the cost of uh, firms doing business, and when borrowing costs rise, uh, essentially marginal cost is increasing. Okay, so these types of stories could generate a negative co-movement between inflation and output. It might help explain why we've seen um, not as much deflation as, uh, deflation as we otherwise would during the crisis period. And feel free to jump in with questions. Okay, so let me give you an overview of what we do in the paper. Uh, the first thing we're going to do is look at the data and see exactly what happened. So here what we're going to do is we're going to go to individual price level data using the Bureau of Labor Statistics producer prices. So these are the individual prices for different goods in the economy. They're collected by the Bureau of Labor Statistics. And they're the prices that are, are used to construct the producer price index for the United States. So we're going to go to this price level data and we're going to match these individual prices to producers and then match those producers to a set of firms where we can measure their income and their balance sheet statement. So this will be a very micro-oriented analysis. And then we're going to look exactly at how the balance sheet conditions of firms influence the price setting behavior. So in other words, did price setting differ based on whether or not firms had strong balance sheets or weak balance sheets? Okay, so that's going to be the first half of the talk. And then the second half of the talk, we're going to study, uh, I'm going to put together a DSGE, a dynamic stochastic general equilibrium model. It's going to incorporate these two elements of customer markets in which setting a low price is an investment in future demand and financial frictions. We're going to study the dynamics of that model and what it might imply about inflation and output dynamics. So that's the roadmap for the talk.
Okay, so let me tell you a little bit about the data. Uh, so this is a fairly involved um, project in terms of uh, using the Bureau of Labor Statistics price data. So that's proprietary confidential data, and all of that has to be done down in Washington at the Bureau of Labor Statistics. So this data set has been used by other people, such as Nakamura and Steinson, Goldberg and Hellerstein, Adarai and Schoenle, uh for export prices. And um, it's survey data, so they, they um, uh, or, or it's a random sample. They get a random sample, and then they go and they measure the prices, the transaction prices that firms are setting. Okay, so there are many uh, different firms in this data set, and we want to match it to a data set of firms where we can measure income and balance sheets. So we're going to use CompuStat data, which is a standard uh, data set used in the U.S. to study uh, firm-level behavior. CompuStat firms are large firms. They're publicly traded firms. That's why they're on CompuStat. Uh, so the sample is limited in that sense. We're just actually studying what's happened to large firms, which are actually presumably less subject to financial frictions than other firms in the economy. Um, so what we succeed in doing is matching 700 CompuStat firms to the respondents in the producer price index database. Our sample is going to start in January 2005, and it's going to go through September 2012. So this is really the first uh, systematic attempt at combining balance sheet and income data um, with broad price indices um, for the whole economy. All right, the matching is fairly involved, and a lot of work has gone into doing that. Um, but I won't really talk about that much more than that. Okay, so um, just to give you a sense as to what uh, this data of matched sample looks like relative to the full sample, what you can see in this plot is the inflation rate, the three-month moving average inflation rate, for the firms in the full sample, which is the black line. Right, so the black line. And the firms in our match sample, which is the red line. Okay, and as you can see, we do pretty well at matching the overall inflation dynamics during, during this period. There's a little bit more noise early on, but certainly during the crisis period, and then subsequently, our sample looks very close to the overall sample. So we're fairly confident that we're getting something that looks reasonably representative. Okay, so now what I'd like to do is show you some pictures of what I'm going to call relative inflation. So we're going to compute inflation for a given firm relative, or uh, I'm sorry, we're going to compute inflation for a given price relative to its industry, okay? And then we're going to take those relative inflation rates and construct what I'm going to call the average relative inflation rate for a given firm by averaging across the goods that that firm uh, produces and they're sampled in the PPI. So typically in our sample, each firm has about seven or eight different goods where we're getting an individual price. Okay, and so then what I'd like to do is sort these firms based on their balance sheet characteristics, on observable characteristics. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to measure a balance sheet characteristic, say liquidity. Liquidity is basically uh, cash and liquid assets divided by total assets. So firms with high liquidity have strong balance sheets, and firms with low liquidity have weak balance sheets. So I'm going to measure the, the average liquidity over the previous four quarters, sort firms into two bins, above and below the median for the liquidity value, uh, based on that measure and then compute the average inflation rate relative to the industry uh, inflation rate for firms with the strong balance sheets, those above the median, relative to firms with the weak balance sheets, those below the median. Uh, I'll look at three different financial characteristics. I'll first look at liquidity, which seems like the most natural. Uh, different people have used cash flow, which is a profit-based measure, so operating income divided by total assets. You could also think of something that's more debt-based, so interest coverage, 
the total interest expense relative to their sales, for example. Now, um, I'll also uh, show you some plots where we sort firms based on other characteristics. And I'm going to consider two. The first is um, the extent to which firms operate in customer markets. So, uh, Francois Gurio and Lena Redanko have a nice paper on customer markets, and they argue that there's a category of um, expenses in the CompuStat data. It's called sales and general administrative expenses, which is a reasonable indicator as to whether or not firms are, have large sales forces, they pay a lot of advertising, generally behave <clears throat> in such a way that they operate in customer markets. So we're going to sort firms based on this uh, criterion of do they have a high sales and general administrative expense. Now another way to think about uh, sales and general administrative expenses is that those are actually fixed costs rather than variable costs. And the fixed versus variable cost interpretation will be consistent with our model because firms with fixed costs will have a lot higher volatility of profits and therefore uh, may be um, more subject to financial frictions in a downturn. Another criterion we're going to look at is just durability of output, durable goods versus non-durable goods. Okay, so um, this plot that you can see now is uh, a relative inflation plot. So it's the average inflation rate relative to the industry for all the firms with strong balance sheets. So there are three different lines here. And these would correspond to the three different financial criteria that we've looked at. Uh, the black line is firms sort of based on their liquid asset ratio. The red line is based on their operating income. And the blue line is based on interest expense. They all tell exactly the same picture, which is that the firms who have strong balance sheets were more likely to reduce their prices relative to the industry during the recession, during the financial crisis. Okay, so it's a very sharp reduction in inflation. It's a large number, so minus 6% on an annual basis. So this says that firms with strong balance sheets cut their prices relative to their industry uh, as the financial crisis unfolded. Okay, so the, the flip side of this picture is the firms with the weak balance sheets. And, um, and that's this picture here. And so the opposite of that story then is the firms with the weak balance sheets actually raise their prices um, relative to their uh, competitors during the financial crisis. Okay, and again, this is a large number. It's two and a half percentage point difference. Okay, so that seems like fairly interesting um, uh, evidence that there's something going on that links price setting to balance sheet data. Now, um, those were inflation rates. And if you accumulate up these uh, inflation rates, uh, as I'm showing you in this plot here, these are the cumulative inflation rates. You can see that these effects are highly persistent. So here what I've done is I've accumulated up the, the relative inflation rates for the firms with the strong versus weak balance sheets by these three different criteria. You can see that the firms with this, um, the weak balance sheets uh, maintain persistently high inflation for a long period of time. The firms with the strong balance sheets are persistently high price levels. Firms with the strong balance sheets uh, maintain persistently low price levels for a long period of time. Okay. Now, this, strictly speaking, is, is um, uh, not exactly what happens to the price level because firms are being resorted um, quarter by quarter. And so, um, but it gives you an idea that there's a strong persistence going on here. Um, probably the blue lines, which are the ones where there's uh, not much resorting going on because it's based on interest expense, are the most indicative. 
And what those suggest, which I like, is that there's a very strong persistence in the effect, but the differences are converging over time in terms of relative prices. Simon, uh, I, yeah. okay, okay. So, yeah, so let me, um, yeah, yeah. So I'm going to I'm going to present a model. But the basic idea is that um, firms would firms with weak balance sheets, if if they weren't balance sheet constrained, what they'd like to do is lower their prices. Okay, so they don't lose market share in the future. But if they lower their prices. That means they get less revenue today and less profits today. And they're in a situation where they're cash constrained. And so they just can't afford to lower their prices, essentially. Um, and Julio asks, what's the proportion of financially constrained and not financially constrained firms in the sample? Here, it's we're, we just divided the sample based on the median. So, 50% of the firms are above the median and 50% are below, okay? Um, okay, so let me show you a couple more plots. Uh, this is relative inflation when you sort firms by their uh, selling and general administrative expenses. And so one way to interpret this is the firms with the high selling of general administrative expenses, those we would think are more likely to operate in customer markets, were indeed likely to raise their prices during the financial crisis, whereas the firms, and therefore have high inflation relative to the industry, whereas the firms that don't tend to operate in the customer markets were more likely to lower their prices. Okay, so this is entirely consistent with the story we'd like to tell. Okay, so I'm going to show you one more plot of relative inflation rates. And here what I've done is I've sorted firms on two dimensions, both their balance sheet strength and whether or not they operate in a durable goods industry or a non-durable goods industry. And here what you can see is that the entire story we're talking about is happening in the non-durable goods industry, which are the red lines. So the durable goods, there's very little price movement whatsoever for either the firms that have strong balance sheets or the firms that have weak balance sheets. Prices just don't seem to move very much. Now this is, a, we already know that prices of durable goods are a big puzzle, <clears throat> especially during the crisis period. So this goes back to work by Bills and Cleanout and other people to document that uh, durable goods prices just don't seem to behave the way we would think they would. So we're not going to try and explain durable goods prices here. So you can think of us as essentially talking about what's going on for non-durable goods. And I think that's also consistent with our story, is durable goods are purchased infrequently, and therefore they're less likely to be um, experienced goods or where you have repeat customers and where customer market type mechanisms would matter. So. Okay, so now, um, now I want to talk about the microdata. Okay, so everything I showed you so far was inflation relative to the industry. What we'd like to also think about is just if you looked at nominal price behavior, what's going on? And so here what we can do is we can take advantage of the fact that we have micro price data. Okay, and so first I'm going to ask the question, to what extent does price setting respond to financial variables such as the liquidity ratio and other controls at the firm level? So I'm going to estimate um, a multinomial logit 
where I'm going to look at whether or not a firm actually increases the price of a given good, keeps it constant, or decreases the price in a given uh, month. All right. So on average, firms don't change their prices that frequently in this data set. It's about um, every six months on average, I think. So there are a lot of times where they're not changing prices at all. And then sometimes they're raising the price and sometimes they're lowering the price. So I'm going to uh, estimate this regression using firm-specific variables, which will include the liquidity ratio. I'll also include the sales and general administrative expense ratio, this measure of customer markets. I'll include sales growth at the firm level. So some firms might be growing, and that might affect their pricing behavior. Some firms might um, be shrinking. I'm going to include a full set of macroeconomic time dummies. So we're sweeping out all of the common macroeconomic behavior. And then I'm also going to control for industry effects using um, industry dummies. Now, what I'm interested in here is not just what the coefficient on the liquidity ratio looks like, but how that coefficient changed as the crisis unfolded. So I'm going to estimate this regression. Um, uh, I guess this is a quarterly regression. I'm going to estimate this um, using uh, a set of four quarters. And then I'm going to roll that four quarter window ahead, quarter by quarter. And I'm going to compute a coefficient of interest. And I'm just going to show you what the elasticity is associated with that coefficient and how it changes as the financial crisis unfolds. Um, so, uh, Alberto asked, Alberto, is it all right if I respond by words, or do you want me to type? No, it is, it is fine. It is very, if you, if you respond okay. with, with okay. your... Right. Um, okay, so, so you, right, so you might think that um, firms are poorly managed um, uh, with their financial accounts and maybe not efficient price setters. But actually, what you see is firms with the weak balance sheets actually, on average, became more likely to change their prices. So they became relative to firms with the strong balance sheets. So just did they change their price at all? They became more likely to adjust, either up or down. So that suggests that they're actually not poor at managing their prices. They're trying to actively, more actively manage their prices during the crisis period. Um, now, there's another concern, which is maybe the firms with the weak balance sheets are just weak firms in general, and they have weak sales and weak profits and things like that. OK? We're, but first off, we're actually controlling for sales. And secondly, you would think that if firms have poor profits, um, because it's a low demand, they should actually be lowering their prices, not raising their prices. Um, but we are, we're explicitly concerned about this issue that um, firms with bad balance sheets might just be badly managed. They might just never change their prices or something like that. And, and you actually see the opposite of that in the data. Okay, so I'm just going to show you. I'm not going to show you the whole regression. I'm just going to focus on... Um, the elasticity, which is key. So this is the um, this plots the elasticity. So the percent change in the probability that you lower your price for the downward price change. Okay. Um, for a given percent uh, increase in liquidity, and you can see that this coefficient on average positive. So it says that firms with stronger liquidity are just, on average, more likely to have a price reduction than firms with weak liquidity. Okay, And so a 1% increase in your liquidity will give you about a, a 10 basis point increase in the likelihood that you would lower your price. OK, so I think that's consistent with the overall story. But you can also see that there's not much change in that coefficient 
as the crisis unfolds. On the right-hand side panel, though, we plot what's the elasticity of the probability that you actually raise your price in response to a 1% increase in liquidity. And here what you can see is that on average, having more, or at least at the beginning of the crisis, having more liquidity doesn't seem to really affect the probability that you would raise your price, right? But then as the crisis unfolds, liquidity seems to really matter, and the firms with strong liquidity become, more li become much less likely to raise their price relative to the firms with weak liquidity. Okay, so I think of this as very strong evidence in favor of the story, that the firms with the strong balance sheets um, were less likely to engage in price increases, and the firms with the weak balance sheets were more likely to engage in price increases, precisely during the financial crisis. Um, you could also look at the elasticities with respect to the selling general and administrative expenses. Um, you see something similar overall. So, so there's two things to note here. First of all, the elasticity for both the downward price changes and the upward price changes is negative. And what that means is that firms with high selling and general administrative expenses are overall just less likely to change their price. And if I were just to plot the probability of a price change, sorted and sort firms based on their median criterion for this administrative expense number, you would see that the firms with the high administra selling administrative expense were about 50% um, less likely in a given period to just change their price. And I think this is consistent with the idea that these are firms that are operating in customer markets, where in customer markets you want to keep the price stable. You don't want to surprise or annoy your customers and things like that. So overall, the coefficients on this um, variable are negative. But what you can see is that there is a change in the coefficient. It's not um, a dramatic change for the downward price change, <clears throat> but the more likely you were to engage in the customer market, the less likely you were to have a price reduction during this period, and the more likely you were to have a price increase. So again, I think this is consistent with the overall story. The firms that are operating in customer markets in a financial crisis are more likely to raise their prices. Um, so Julio asks, what can you say about price dispersion across your firm classifications? For instance, have firms with weaker balance sheets more dispersed prices than those with stronger balance sheets? Um, I don't think we've explicitly looked at price dispersion within the categories, but what this is saying is that there's more price dispersion overall, okay? Um, because the financial crisis is causing the firms with the weak balance sheets to move in opposite directions of the firms with the strong balance sheets. And that mechanism isn't present prior to the financial crisis. And in the model, we're going to have a model where we're going to see more price dispersion during the financial crisis or during um, an economic downturn from exactly this mechanism. Okay, so that's going to be built into the model. All right, but just to go back, Right? This picture implies price dispersion, right? Among those weak firms with weak balance sheets relative to the firms with strong balance sheets. We're seeing a lot of price dispersion going on. Did I answer your question, Julio? Okay, so um, that basically summarizes, oh, no, I'm going to give you one more uh, set of results, sorry. Um, okay, so those were um, coefficients describing 
whether or not you're likely to increase or decrease your price. So you can think about um, that as the extensive margin, not the intensive margin. Um, Alberto, you're saying why and why the effect was so long lasting? Well, no, no, it's not just because it's a cumulative graph, right? I mean, if it wasn't long lasting, we would have seen a, we would have seen a quick reversal in the inflation rates, right? We would have seen um, the firms with the strong balance sheets have low inflation for a few periods and then really high inflation for a few periods, and we don't see that. So these effects are long lasting. They're going to be long lasting in the model, as you can as as I'll as I'll describe to you. And basically, they're going to be long-lasting because there's a strong feedback mechanism, a dynamic feedback mechanism. If you start to lose market share, you raise your price, you raise your price, and you start to lose market share. Then your balance sheet is going to be weaker in the future because you've lost market share. So essentially, what's happening is your customer base is your capital stock, and a depressed capital stock is going to imply that you can have low profits in the future and so you're going to face continued financial pressure in the future and you would expect these mechanisms to be long lasting okay and so i'm going to show you that in the model that that that's exactly what happens okay so um let me describe one last regression so here we're going to combine the intensive and the extensive margin and um, all I'm going to do is I'm going to look at the, the um, three-month price change of a given product. So product I for firm J at time T. And this price change could be zero if the firm doesn't change its prices, or it could be positive, it could be negative. Okay? And I'm just going to regress that. And what's nice about this regression is we can control for fixed firm effects because it's just a linear regression. So I'm going to control at the individual firm level for firm characteristics, right, that are constant. And then I'm going to include time-varying firm, uh, firm characteristics, the liquidity ratio, the sales growth variable, et cetera. I'm again going to control for macroeconomic variation by using a full set of macro time dummies, right? And I'm going to estimate this regression again with a four-quarter rolling window. And I'm interested in asking the question, how does the coefficient on the liquidity variable change in this regression that captures the full price change? Okay, both the intensive and the extensive margin. Okay, and you can see that this is the coefficient on the liquidity ratio. Uh, so, so again, this is estimate the firm level, all right? We're controlling for firm fixed effects. And prior to the financial crisis, liquidity has no impact on firm price setting. Okay, the coefficient is essentially zero. It's not statistically different from zero. And then you can see, consistent with the other plots, that as the crisis unfolds, the coefficient on the liquidity variable becomes strongly negative. Firms with the strong balance sheets became much more likely to lower their price than firms with the weak balance sheet. Okay, so um, uh, I don't remember um, exactly what the number uh, here is. So, so the coefficient is minus 0.6. Um, and I believe that that implies that a one standard deviation in the liquidity ratio would deliver something like a two percentage point difference in inflation rates. So these are big coefficients here. Okay, but you can, you know, this is consistent with all the other plots. So both just looking at industry relative inflation rates, you see this marked difference between firms with strong and weak balance sheets. Looking at the micro level, uh, extensive margin decision of raising your price, keeping your price constant or lowering your price. You see a strong uh, balance sheet effect that unfolds during the financial crisis but didn't exist prior to the crisis. And then if you look at the full effect on the price change, 
at the firm level of the liquidity variable, you again see a very strong effect that unfolds during the crisis period. Okay, so this is all we've done in terms of um, empirical work. Uh, we have a number of other uh, things we'd like to follow up on. Um, one project that we'd like to consider is to be able to expand the sample that we're looking at beyond just these CompuStat firms, okay? Because these are large firms, and so you would think that if this is happening for large firms, it's even more likely to be happening for the smaller firms that have less uh, access to, fi to finance. Um, so we have a number of other projects in the works like that. Um, so Alberto's asking, do we observe differences across industries? Uh, do you mean like across industries in terms of um, financial access or other characteristics? <laughs> um, there's definitely differences across industries in terms of pricing behavior. Some industries um, are more likely to change or change prices more frequently than other industries. Um, you know that that's what I told you earlier. If you looked at those coefficients on the selling general administrative expenses, this says that the basically, if you looked at industries where firms tend to have high selling general administrative expenses, they're less likely to change their prices overall. I'm not sure if that answers your question, uh, Alberto. Yes, uh, thank you. I just was wondering, because you you show uh, relative values of within an industry, all this was behavior right, right. Uh, of financially constrained versus financially unconstrained firms, but within right. the same industry category. And I, I was wondering if there is big differences on these these general charts uh, in some specific industries that might tell some stories about what is going on in in say all, all of these are non durable goods is that right or yeah uh, no no the, I mean these are all firms right but um, in in terms of these types of plots the effect seems to be really dominated by the non durable goods okay. So these are, but all all the firms are in our sample. So it, it, those so those might tend to be running the microregression. Then we have all firms in that sample. Now I think the big concern, the big concern is that um, that some firms are more um, commodity based than other firms, right? That they're maybe they're their cost structure or things like that are, are more closely linked to commodities. And that somehow that's correlated with their financial position. So that when we sort by financial position, we would just be picking up a sensitivity to the commodity market. Um, that's not obvious why that story would be the case, but what we have done in the micro regressions is that we've included um, an interaction between oil prices and the financial variable in all of the regressions. So if, if it's just that firms with weak balance sheets are, are you know, less likely to operate in a commodity market than a firm with a strong balance sheet, then that type of a mechanism we've controlled for. So, um, but there are concerns like that, right? That some, you know, industries are different and maybe we're just capturing some industry difference in terms of price sensitivity to cost or something. Is that what you're thinking about or, or was there other? Yes, uh, that those difference in the industries might be driven, might, may, might be driving some of the, of the results, but then as you present some of the evidence that everything is relative to the industry average, I, I think it is very convincing that there are a strong difference in the, in the pricing behavior. So thank you very much. Yeah. So, I mean, to be clear, um, the industry controls are relatively coarse. They're two digit. So, you know, 
you might think, well, maybe that's not fine enough or something like that, okay? So we're actually redoing this using um, uh, three-digit controls, um, which we can do much better. And, um, and I think we actually might be able to do this with four-digit industry controls. So, um, so, you know, basically construct the price of an individual product relative to its four-digit industry. So that's, um, I don't think that will change these results though, so. Um, okay, so I'm now going to move on to think about a model and talk about a model. And I want these two key ingredients in the model. So, um, Jorge is asking, do differences in price elasticities of demand, could they contribute to explain some of the observed differences? Again, you'd have to um, in some sense, yes, but that's part of our story, in a way, is that the price elasticity of demand is endogenous, okay, and it actually depends on your financial position. So, um, but um, more generally, do we, you know, are different, you know, I would think that that's a different in, uh, industry story, right? Like, a, um, you know, within a certain industry, demand is either price elastic or not elastic or something like that. So, um, and that's why doing something a little bit more refined on the industry level is good. But, um, uh, yeah. Okay, so I'm gonna move on to the model if that's, if that's okay unless there are further questions on the data. I'm not sure what the difference between the price elasticity of demand or supply is. So, uh, my, my, my question is, your story is how, how Respondent, uh, uh, these firms are to these uh, macro conditions, but it, it is in part. Uh, I, let, let me think about it. <laughs> okay. Um, so, um, okay, so I'm going to move on to the model now, okay? So we want two ingredients in the model. We want this customer markets mechanism where there's an active trade-off. If you lower your price today, your current profits are lower, but you're going to gain possibly some future market share. Okay. And then we're going to incorporate a financial friction. And the financial friction is going to imply that uh, when demand or economic activity is low, firms are going to be more concerned about raising funds, external funds, and effectively they're going to value a dollar today more than a dollar tomorrow. In other words, they're going to discount the future more when demand is low. And that's going to give them an incentive to keep the markup high. So we want these two mechanisms. I want to embed it into uh, an otherwise standard general equilibrium model with new Keynesian features, nominal price rigidities. Okay, so uh, in order to get the customer habits, we're going to follow uh, Raven, Schmidt, Grohe, and Uribe. Or in order to get the customer market, we're going we're gonna to use the Raven, Schmidt, Grohe, and Uribe deep habits formulation. Okay, and so we can think about there being a, a representative household that's maximizing a present discount of value of utility. And utility depends on labor input H and then an aggregate composite X of um, goods produced um, 
by firms. There's going to be a demand shifter delta, so that's going to be our demand shock. It's going to shift marginal utility around. It'll be exogenous. Okay, the aggregator X is a Dixit Stiglitz aggregate of individual goods. And the individual goods are good CIT, okay, um, uh, produced by firm I for household J. Okay, so J is indexing the, the household here. Now, the demand for good, um, uh, good I depends on the past consumption of good I through this habit stock S. Okay, so there's the S, S to the theta. Now, um, if theta is zero, there's no habit. And if theta is positive, then there's a habit. And the habit stock evolves, sorry, according to um, a fairly standard exponential accumulation equation. The current habit stock depends on the last habit, uh, previous habit with some decay, and then on your current consumption. So if you've consumed in the past, if you've been consuming more than average in the past, then your habit is strong, and that actually raises the demand for your good. Okay. Now it's important that these are deep habits because there's a monopoly supplier of each good, CIT. And that monopoly supplier understands that if they change their price, they'll generate more demand and that they will also change the habit. Okay. Now, from the perspective of the household, we're going to assume that these habits are external. That the household just takes them as given. So this is a, a quote, keeping up with the Joneses version of habit formation for the household. But from their firm's perspective, the firms are going to recognize that as they change price, by manipulating current demand, they also affect future demand. Okay, so that is a, a fairly standard formulation. Um, and then each of these firms that produces one of these monopoly supplied goods is going to have a standard production function. There's no capital, uh, physical capital in the model, so production is a Cobb-Douglas function of the labor input. So I index is a firm, so output depends on the labor input. It depends on an aggregate level of technology AT. That's common to everybody. And then there's going to be this idiosyncratic productivity shock, AIT. So AIT is, we're dividing by AIT, so think of that as a cost shock. Some firms get a good cost shock, some firms get a bad cost shock. Now AIT is just going to be uh, IID. So ex ante firms look identical and then some firms have a good outcome and some firms have a bad outcome. I'm also going to allow for fixed costs. And what fixed costs are going to do is that they're going to imply that profits in any given period can go negative. Okay. And you can think of this as fixed costs, and fixed costs could be firm specific. Later, I, I'm going to assume to begin with that all firms are the same. And then think about what happens when um, when there are two types of firms, firms with, with fixed costs and firms without. But another way to think about fixed costs is that it's actually something like um, interest expense. Okay, it's going to mean that relative to variable profits, you have some fixed interest expense that you have to cover. And if you can't cover that, then you're going to be in trouble. You have to go raise some external funds. So you can think about this as also capturing a debt overhang type mechanism. Okay, so that's production. Um, and then the key idea here is that firms make their decision in terms of their price setting prior to their realization of what the marginal cost is. Okay, so they don't know whether or not they can get a good cost shock or a bad cost shock. They commit to a price which means they commit to a certain amount that they have to sell and produce. And then if they get a good cost shock, that's great, and they'll have positive profits. 
And those profits, I'm just going to assume that if they have positive profits, they pay them out in dividends. The firms that have a bad cost shock, they could get negative profits. And I'm going to rule out, uh, I'm going to, so negative profits or negative dividends are essentially equity issuance. And I'm going to assume that if you have negative dividends, you have to go raise some money, it's going to be costly for you to do that. There's going to be some um, dilution cost fee. So if I need to raise a dollar, I'm going to lose fee cents on the dollar by having to raise that money. Okay. So what does that mean? That means that you'd like to avoid the situation where you have negative profits because that's an extra cost to you. You have to go and raise some funds. Okay. So if you set a low markup, you can have low profits today. Okay, that's going to help you in terms of building future market share, maybe. But it's also risky because you're more likely to have this bad outcome where you incur negative uh, profits and have to go raise funds on the market. All right. Um, so this is a very simple way to get financial frictions in the model. Okay, now, um, one thing to understand is that when, when I'm doing this, I'm assuming that firms aren't saving. Okay, they either pay out their dividends if they're positive, or if they're negative, they have to go issue equity. But I'm trying to keep the model really simple by not having a, a firm-specific net worth variable here. Okay, but this is just enough to get what I want. Okay, so we're going to have um, nominal price rigidities, and they're going to be a quadratic costs of a price setting. And then um, there's going to be a Taylor rule in the model. Okay, so in the absence of habits, in the absence of financial frictions, this model is a standard three equation New Keynesian model. Okay, we can think about what the firm problem looks like. The firm is going to maximize the present discounted value of dividends, DIT, okay, subject to the constraints. The first is the production function, okay. Um, the second constraint is what I'll call the cash flow constraint, okay, where your revenue minus your costs either have to be positive or you have to go and incur um, issue dividends and incur, um, or sorry, issue equity and incur equity issuance costs. So this uh, term here, this is the Lagrange, Lagrange multiplier on relaxing the constraint and giving you an extra dollar inside the firm. Okay, so this um, psi IT term is a shadow value of a dollar to the firm. Um, the firm also understands that it um, manipulates its demand curve. Okay, so it faces a downward sloping demand curve. And it also uh, understands that it controls the habit stock. Okay. So some of these variables, the price, therefore the output, and therefore the habit are chosen before you see your cost shock. And then you've chosen your price, you've committed to a certain amount of production. Uh, once you get your cost shock, that determines how much labor you need. And then that will determine your profits. If your profits are positive, you don't have to issue equity. If your profits are negative, you have to go raise funds. Okay, so we can think about a series of optimality conditions which we go through in the paper. The most important one is the equity issuance. Okay, and basically there's going to be, all firms ex ante are identical here. All right, they come into the period all the same. They all set the same price. And some of them have a good outcome and some of them have a bad outcome. The firms with the good outcome, they have a low cost shock. All right they won't have to issue equity. So their shadow value of funds is one. The firms with a bad outcome, they have negative profits, they'll have to go raise some funds. Their marginal cost of issuing funds is fee, and the shadow value of funds is one over one minus fee. Okay, so that says that a dollar inside the firm to those guys is worth more than a dollar outside the firm. Okay. And what determines the cutoff? The cutoff is um, 
the level of the idiosyncratic shock such that you actually have exactly zero profits. Okay, now, um, prior to the realization of the, of the cost shock, we can actually compute the expected value of the Lagrange multiplier. Okay, the expected value of funds. And so the expected cost of external funds is strictly greater than one. Okay, because any given firm may be in the situation of having a negative cost shock that puts them in the region of having to issue equity. Okay, so on average, firms are facing financial constraints. The expected shadow value of funds is greater than one. So now let's think a little bit about markups. I'm just emphasizing the parts of the model that are, that are unique, okay? So typically we would compute the aggregate markup in this model, uh, absent financial frictions, um, is the inverse of marginal cost, right? Because these firms might have to issue equity and that's costly to them, there's gonna be something I'm gonna call a financially adjusted markup. And the financially adjusted markup takes into account that with positive probability, you might incur these financial costs. So these financial costs look like higher marginal costs. Higher marginal costs is a lower markup. Okay, you can think about this mechanism as the cost channel that Barth and Ramey talk about. Now the cost channel is actually the ratio of the Lagrange multiplier divided by the Lagrange multiplier interacted with this um, cost shock. So although it's strictly less than one, this ratio, therefore marginal cost is high, um, it's not gonna vary very much over the business cycle. And this uh, cost shock, purely cost shock mechanism isn't really that important. What is important is the fact that firms are gonna discount the future based on whether or not they are likely to be constrained or not. Okay, so if there are no customer markets, then every firm is just gonna set its uh, price as a markup over marginal cost. Okay, and this is a familiar equation which says exactly that. Eta over eta minus one is the gross markup in this model. Okay, so no customer markets means no habit. And here, the marginal cost would reflect the financial cost as well. So it's my financially adjusted markup term, U tilde. Okay, that would be with no customer markets. With customer markets, the firm is forward looking. It not only cares about the current marginal cost, it cares about the entire present value of the future marginal cost as well. Okay, so that's what the customer markets do. Um, but how it cares about the future depends on how it values a dollar in the future, this Lagrange multiplier on the dividend constraint in the future, relative to how it values a dollar today, okay? And this is the mechanism, how much a dollar is worth today versus a future that's really gonna matter in this model. Gabrielle, I, I'm not sure I understand this question you're asking. Okay. Okay, so, so this is without any nominal price or duties going on, all right? But basically, there's two ways a financial friction comes in. One is it affects marginal cost directly, and that's the Barth and Ramey cost channel mechanism. And that was reflected in the adjustment to, to the markup, U tilde, rather than UT. But the second and more important mechanism is that if you're financially constrained today, you discount the future more than if you're financially unconstrained, okay? Now, once we go to, um, sticky prices, so quadratic cost of adjusting prices, then we're gonna get something that looks like the standard Phillips curve. I have inflation today, I have expected inflation tomorrow, and I have the markup. 
the current markup. If I have um, uh, customer markets, then I also have future markups. Okay, that's those terms in here. If I have financial frictions, then not only do I have future markups, but I've also got this term here, which is in logs, the shadow value of a dollar today relative to tomorrow, relative to the future. Okay. So what this says is it's not for inflation dynamics, this is going to look like an extra term in the Phillips curve. It's going to look something like credit spreads matter for the Phillips curve. Okay. If you think that uh, financial conditions are reflected in something like credit spreads. And then what's important here is that it's not if on average firms are constrained, but if you're temporarily constrained, what's going to happen is that's going to push inflation up. So the coefficient on this term is positive, right? So if your shadow value is high today relative to the future, then that's going to cause inflation, okay? Um, Okay, so, and then absent the financial frictions, absent the customer markets, this is, again, just a standard uh, Phillips curve. Okay, but the key point here, though, is that this term here is going to imply that financial constraints, uh, if you're more constrained today relative to what you expect in the future, you're more likely to raise your price. And so that's going to create inflation in the economy. Okay. Okay, then the rest of the model is standard. The households, um, they have a standard pricing kernel, so that they're making a trade-off between consumption today and consumption tomorrow. The pricing kernel has to reflect the, the overall habit. There's a labor-leisure trade-off, okay? And then uh, consumption is equal to output, and there are also the cost of price adjustment in the resource constraint. Now we calibrate the model. Um, so there are two things to think about when we calibrate the model relative to the standard New Keynesian model. One are the things that govern the deep habits. And the second are the severity of the financial frictions. Okay, so the deep habits, um, we're just going to take parameters that are very close to what um, uh, Raven, Schmidt, Grohe, and Uribe have. So the persistence at a quarterly uh, basis of the deep habit is 0.95. The, the deep habit effect itself has a coefficient theta of 0.95. There's an elasticity substitution between goods set at 2. They're decreasing returns of scale at 0.8. Okay. Um, the nominal price rigidities, those are standard new Keynesian coefficients. Um, the Taylor rule coefficients are also fairly standard. Uh, there's inertia in the Taylor rule. The financial frictions essentially depend on three things. The fixed operating costs. If you don't have fixed any fixed costs, then you would negative have, never have negative profits, so you could always issue dividends. Okay, so fixed operating costs are going to be key. We calibrate that so that the average dividend payout matches the data. And then we, um, we're going to consider um, Idiosyncratic volatility, that's going to determine the probability that you hit the constraint, along with the equity issuance cost. The equity issuance cost, as a baseline, we're to think about 0.3, meaning if you have to go and raise funds in an emergency, it's going to cost you 30 cents for every dollar. Now, that sounds like a high number, but really what we care about is the expected cost of funds for a firm when they're setting their price. And essentially, this is something like a 12% rate of interest when the coefficient is 0.3. I'm going to contrast that with a more severe situation where the coefficient is 0.5. When the coefficient is 0.5, firms are very reluctant to raise any external funds. Um, it corresponds to an external finance premium of about 20%. Okay, so 12%. 
Um, I'm going to skip the um, flexible price economy. I'm going to go straight to the, um, the demand shock. Okay, so this is a demand shock. So what happens when demand is low is, uh, so there's a reduction in demand, uh, and uh, the blue line is a model without the financial frictions. So output will fall, prices will fall, and we'll get negative inflation. The markup will actually increase. Markups are a little bit countercyclical. That's kind of the standard new Keynesian mechanism, All right? They actually go eventually. They become um, uh, fall below the steady state. But deep habits don't really dramatically change the baseline model, new Keynesian model. We add the financial friction, then what happens when there's a reduction in demand? is that overall revenues are low and profits are low relative to fixed cost. When profits are low relative to fixed cost, more firms are likely to hit the constraint and have to go issue equity. So more firms are going to become constrained when economic activity is low relative to when it's high. Firms are going to respond. The value of internal funds is now very high. Okay, it's about a 2% increase in the value of internal funds. Firms are going to respond um, by increasing their markups, which is going to generate inflation in the model. Okay, so a negative demand shock in our model with financial frictions would cause a contraction in output, but an increase in inflation. Um, <clears throat> this co picture combines, it asks the question, what if there's a situation where there's going to be a demand shock and all firms face really severe financial constraints, fee is 0.5, versus a situation where there's a negative demand shock? And on average, firms' constraints aren't that bad, but they become temporarily worse. Fee, this cost of issuing equity, goes from 0.3 to 0.37. What this highlights is that relative to the model where there's severe financial conditions and a demand shock, if there's less severe financial conditions, but at the same time a financial shock, the output contraction will be worse. The value of internal funds will rise more. The markup will actually increase more we'll actually see more inflation in the economy, okay? And the key idea here is that it's not overall whether or not firms are financially constrained. It's if they're temporarily more constrained today than tomorrow, then they think, look, I might as well uh, keep my prices high because I'm only constrained for a small amount of time, so I'm willing to forego the, uh, the future market share for a temporary amount of time. All firms are trying to do this simultaneously, however. All firms try and raise their prices. Firms can't succeed at individually um, or, or in aggregate raising their prices, so markups just increase. We do see positive inflation, uh, much more than you would if we don't have the financial shock going on. Okay, so this is exactly the story that says that in a financial crisis, we should expect to see inflation through this mechanism relative to a world where we don't have customer markets and financial frictions going on. Okay, now um, the model actually raises some interesting questions about policy. In particular, what we have now, we no longer have in response to demand shocks what the New Keynesians would typically call the divine coincidence. And the divine coincidence is the idea that if there's a negative demand shock, you typically see prices falling and output falling. And so there's no trade-off in terms of monetary policy. If we lower interest rates, the monetary authority can achieve go the goal of stabilizing prices and stabilizing output. Okay. What this picture highlights is 
as you vary the coefficient on the Taylor rule in terms of the output gap, in the first case, the coefficient on output is zero. And then we steadily increase the coefficient. The red is coefficient of 0.12. The green is coefficient of 0.25. What you can see is that we can, by increasing the coefficient on the output gap, we'll stabilize output. Okay, we'll get a less severe contraction output. But we'll cause more inflation. Okay, so now, in response to demand shocks, the monetary authority actually faces a trade-off. It can stabilize output, but by stabilizing output, it will actually cause inflation. Okay, so I think we haven't thought about optimal monetary policy in this setup yet, but I think there are a lot of interesting questions about monetary policy in environments where there are customer markets and financial frictions. Uh, we also think about what's happening at the zero lower bound. So what if the model has a zero, zero lower bound binding constraint or the potential for that? And here again, I'm showing you a model with the financial frictions, which is the blue line, and the model without the financial frictions, which is the red line. Now here's something interesting happens. If you're concerned about the zero lower bound, the financial frictions actually become a stabilizing force. And this is the same logic that suggests that um, anything that's inflationary during the downturn will help stabilize in a zero uh, lower bound binding period. Okay, so Edgerson, Gordy Edgerson, for example, has sort of raised the possibility that if you were to increase taxes and that would increase marginal cost, that would cause inflation, and that would, could be beneficial because real interest rates could actually fall. Okay. Similarly here, the financial frictions generate a mechanism to get positive rather than, uh, so inflation rather than deflation, and the consequences of the zero lower bound are going to be much less severe. Um, and again, I, I don't want to push this too far, but I think it's, you know, Clear that in the U.S. we didn't really go into a deflationary spiral during the crisis period. Um, and so, um, okay, but that's just sort of a, uh, a side note, I think. Okay, so the last exercise we do is now I want to think about heterogeneity. I want to think about an environment where some firms have strong balance sheets and some firms have weak balance sheets. Okay, so I'm going to think about there being two types of firms in the economy. Think about there being two sectors. Uh, these sectors are identical to each other, um, so um, except that one sector faces um, more severe financial frictions than the other sector. Okay, so we can think about there being sector two that has higher fixed costs than sector one. Higher fixed costs, you can interpret, again, as maybe more debt overhang or something like that. For simplicity, these sectors have the same size on average. So one half of the economy has a strong balance sheet, and the other half has a relatively weaker balance sheet. Um, now, this is a standard model with just two sectors. Um, agents have preference over the goods produced in each sector in the standard way. Okay, um, through these Dixit Stiglitz preferences. Just think about this real line over which these individual goods are being um, produced. Is half of that line, those goods are coming from firms with a strong balance sheet, and the other half they're coming from firms with a weak balance sheet. Okay, but but now we'll have heterogeneity because the firms with the strong balance sheets will want to set a different price than the firms with the weak balance sheets. Okay, now we'll get price dispersion going on. Okay, so what I want to do is, is examine what happens when we have heterogeneity in this economy. So first I'm going to look at a case where there's just a little bit of heterogeneity. Sector two, the uh, financially constrained firms, they have a fixed cost the way we modeled it earlier. Sector one, they have a little bit better financial condition. Their fixed costs are 0.8. 
of what the other sector has. So they're just a little bit more, a little bit less likely to have to go issue equity for a given price that they've set. Okay. And now I'm going to show you the, you can see the impulse response to, um, this is a financial shock. Okay, so what's a financial shock? It's a, a financial shock is an increase in the cost of external finance, an increase in that coefficient on um, how much it costs you to issue equity. So these firms are identical in every way, except that the one set of firms have stronger balance sheets than the other set of firms. What you can see is that that difference in balance sheet conditions, okay, the size of the fixed costs they face, is going to mean that the financially weak firms are going to raise their prices in relative terms, while the financially strong firms are going to lower their prices. Okay, what that means is the financially strong firms are going to sell more, they're going to have higher output than the financially weak firms. Okay, so we'll naturally get heterogeneity based on balance sheet conditions. As you can see, the heterogeneity is very persistent. Okay, it doesn't disappear until about 30 quarters after the shock. So there are a couple of things going on here. When this financial shock hits, the firm with the weak balance sheets want to raise their prices. They start to raise their price they start to lose market share. The firms with the strong balance sheets actually have an incentive to lower their price in order to steal market share from the firms with the weak balance sheets. Okay, so the very strong feedback mechanism, as these strong firms steal market share, that means that the weak firms have lower demand, lower output, and that they're going to be more likely to hit the constraint in the future. Okay, so we get a very persistent effect over time in terms of the separation of the weak um, balance sheet firms and the strong balance sheet firms. Okay, and there's a very strong externality here that these firms are cutting their prices and they're taking aggregate prices as given, but because they're cutting their prices, they're making these firms weaker. Okay, and it's interesting to contrast this episode where we have a little bit of heterogeneity to what happens when overall, I'm going to call this case two, overall financial conditions are actually better than case one, but there's just more heterogeneity. Okay, so in case two, I'm going to assume that the sector two faces the same financial frictions as before. They have the same fixed cost, fee bar. But sector one faces no financial friction, okay? So on average, the economy is facing less financial frictions in case two than in case one. But there's more heterogeneity. Sector one is, is more different than sector two. Um, oh, so these are, these are the, uh, this is the aggregate output effect in the first case. Okay, so now you can see in the situation where we have more heterogeneity, then we're actually going to get more dispersion going on, which is not surprising. Okay. Um, the financially weak firms are going to have to raise their prices a lot more because the financially strong firms are much more poised to take advantage of the fact that they're strong and the other guys are weak. Okay. So we'll get much more dispersion in outcomes across the financially weak and the financially strong firms. And then importantly, the aggregate effects are actually going to be substantially worse in this situation where there's a financial shock and we have more heterogeneity, but overall financial conditions aren't quite as bad. Okay, or actually they're, they're much better. All right, so you can see the contraction output in this situation where Financial conditions aren't that bad, we have, but we have a lot of heterogeneity. The contraction output in this situation is double what it is in the situation where everybody is in a similar, fairly similar position. Okay. And again, that points to there being a very strong aggregate demand externality 
through this mechanism of habit, um, deep habits, therefore customer markets, combined with the financial frictions. Um, okay, so um, that's pretty much it in terms of what I have to say today. Um, I want to just conclude and then I'm happy to answer questions. Um, I'm going to argue that balance sheet conditions played an important role in price setting dynamics during the financial crisis. Financially healthy firms decrease prices, financially weak firms increase prices. And then in terms of a DSGE model, Combining customer markets and financial frictions, I think, has a lot of interesting implications for inflation output dynamics. We would expect that these mechanisms are going to give you attenuation of inflation in response to demand shocks, if not actually increases in inflation um, in response to negative demand shocks. The model also imply that temporary financial shocks are going to cause severe contractions. And the model also produces what we call this paradox of financial strength. That if you have heterogeneity in terms of financial position, that can be much worse in terms of aggregate outcomes than if everybody faces fairly severe financial conditions. There are interesting questions then about monetary policy, the inflation output trade-off, in response to demand or financial shock. In uh, work that we're currently uh, looking at, we're also thinking about something like the Eurozone, where you could think about a model where there's trade, and think about a country like Spain, where the firms have weak balance sheets, and a country like Germany, where the firms have strong balance sheets, and how this mechanism would play out in an environment where um, there are, um, there's a monetary union versus if there's not a monetary union, for example. And you can look at trade dynamics and, and things like that. So, um, okay, these are my, uh, that's all I have to say. I'm very happy to answer any questions people have. Thank you very much, Simon. So, Hugo Vega from the Central Bank of Peru is writing something. And if someone wants to ask a question, you can either type it in the chat window as we have been doing or you can raise your hand with the status uh, icon and I can open your microphone. Um, so Hugo asked if it would be correct to use the model to support the idea of ex-ante macroprudential policy to strengthen balance sheets during good times. Um, yeah, I mean, this is a model where um, so I, I guess I would say the following, that um, the model that I presented is a very simple model. There's no financial variable from specific financial variable, right? So, so typically we would think about macroprudential policy as influencing, say, the amount of leverage firms or banks are willing to take on, right? And so you could think about, um, you know, if I could augment the models to include a banking sector, which would determine the amount of funds available or something like that, then you wouldn't want the sector to become over leveraged in good times and then see that leverage collapse and no lending to occur in bad times, for example. Um, so so I, I definitely think we could think about macroprudential issues um, related to this. Um, it also suggests that uh, monetary policy, we might want to you know think a little bit harder about the way financial frictions influence inflation versus output. And in particular, what that trade-off might be. So.
So Simon, you skipped the the input responses with uh, flexible prices, but uh, yep. in terms of undoing the mechanism uh, or uh, say when if if you wanna remove some of these distortions, how much is gained through removing financial frictions? How and how much is gained? By removing a price, price rigidity. Right. So um, the basic idea here is that um, so, so customer markets models in the app without financial frictions, macroeconomists don't tend to look at them very much because they they actually tend to predict pro-cyclical rather than counter-cyclical markups. Okay, and the, and the reason is the following. If you have a temporary increase in demand, demand is high today, but it's going to disappear in the future. So there's not a lot of gain from trying to build up your market share because it's just going to disappear on you in the future. So if there's a temporary increase in demand, you actually want to take those guys who are kind of locked in but buying more today, and you want to exploit them, and you want to raise the markup, okay, in a boom. So that implies pro-cyclical markups in these types of models rather than counter-cyclical markups. And you can see that in this picture of the demand shock with the flexible prices. You can see that the with flexible prices and no financial friction, the markup actually falls in, in the downturn. So the markup is pro-cyclical, okay? And what our model does, even without, even without sticky prices, the financial friction will deliver a counter-cyclical markup. Okay? So, in fact, we don't really need sticky prices at all to get the output dynamics that we're talking about. Okay? The, the, the sticky prices don't really play a, an important role um, to get things like relative price dispersion uh, between financially strong and financially weak vectors and to have big, actually, aggregate output effects. But obviously, if we're going to talk about inflation dynamics overall and try and understand that, then we need to think about something that's going to give us nominal rigidities. Okay. But in terms of the output effects and things like that, I don't think it's a big deal. Okay. So you might think, for example, that maybe monetary policy works um, or nominal um, Conditions matter because, say, firms contract in nominal terms. They, they have nominal debt, right? And um, so uh, you have to think about that in this world. But does that answer your question, yes. Roberto? Thank you very much, Simon. So uh, is there any other question? If not, I would like to thank Simon Gilchrist for uh, sharing this this paper with us. The paper is available at Simon's webpage and also in the schedule of the seminars. And I would like to remind you that uh, we'll have a two-week uh, two pause on, on the on the seminars, and we'll restart. We'll on July 1st, with Jordi Galli, who will be talking about the effects of monetary policy on stock market bubbles, uh, where he will be presenting some evidence. So I really thank all of you for participating today, and especially our speaker today, Simon Gokus. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Thank you very Thanks much. Thanks, Alberto, for arranging this.